Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Tarot Podcast, Season 10, Episode 13. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, it is Patriots Week. Uh, we have Ben Valin uh, in the sh- coming on the show in a little bit uh, later today from the Boston Globe. Had him on before to talk Patriots, cause give his insight on what's going up in New England, but what's going on in the world of Dave Bryan. Yeah, absolutely. Excited here. Got a, We had a uh, another fantasy draft, number 26 for me uh, last <laughs> night with the Steelers Depot crew. Uh, I gave you I gave all of y'all a chance to go ahead and just stop, you know, uh, you know, after I got <laughs> after I loaded up on the running backs there. But you, you guys chose to continue on. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that turns out. Wait, but yeah, Let me look at your team because you uh, took Todd Gurley again, which you're, you took him in another league. I know you were telling me. And yeah, I don't know yeah. about that one, Dave. That's that's risky. Uh, I, it is risky. But, I, I you know, in, in, with the points, the way the point style is in this ESPN league. Uh, and I don't forget, I took four four running backs right off too. So all your run, you. all your running backs are belong to us. I don't know. I think I got a pretty good team. I got Le'Veon Bell, who fell to me at ten, which I don't. I think it was a mistake for you guys to let him fall to me. And Dalvin Cook and then Mario Mack in the flex. Who do you? Let's see who you. If you got uh, Gurley, Freeman, you you're really going with poor health with the running backs. You better hope. <laughs> you better sacrifice a goat or something. All right, it's a solid team. I, I got Gordon just in case. I don't think Gordon's going to sit out all year. I got him as my fourth running back. I, you know, uh, odds are I'll probably need him when Gurley goes down. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, But, uh, yeah, you know, and, and I, I think with the scoring system in, in, in this league here, uh, you better load up on the running backs. And, heck, it's only a 12 – it's a 12-team team, team, right? Or 12-team yeah, league, yeah. right? So yeah, uh, that that dimin- you know that, that makes it get back around to you a little bit quicker there. But, uh, yeah, I had, I had a fun uh, draft with all you guys last night. Yeah, we'll see who wins the Depot League. But to move on to Steelers world, Mike Tomlin had his first regular season press conference yesterday, the the Tomlin Tuesday, uh, always led off by the, the, you know, unforgettable good afternoon. And it was a good press conference. I thought Tomlin kind of felt like he was on his game, you know, with the the, the cliches and the the little snappy comebacks. But uh, what was your initial impression of what he said? Yeah, I mean, he he hadn't missed a beat, right? I mean, it looks like uh, he he performed well during training camp in the preseason (laughs) because he painted the barn red. Well, actually, he had the Patriots painting their barn red uh, at at, at one point during the press conference there. As as you said, you know, I loved it. We'll talk about a little bit at some point during the show, you know, talking about uh, uh, the old blockbuster video Netflix uh, VHS analogy (laughs) when it came to uh, Javon Hargrave. I thought that was cute and proper at the same time there. Uh, you know, once he started asking, look, Tomlin, if you ask him the right questions, it could be a great p- press conference. Mm-hmm. You know? Just like Belichick. Kind of exactly. Hey, you, ask, you get Belichick talking about history or ske- schemes mm-hmm. or, or not so much about what his own team might do or about his own players, he'll – he gives great answers, and Tomlin's, Tomlin's the same way too, you know. But if you're going to open up asking about what are you going to do about a headset goes out, you know, that, <laughs> I mean, you, uh, and, and some of the other things that he was asked along the way, you know, uh, you're going to get what you get. But, yeah, overall, you know, I was, I was pleased, and it made, you know, the first, you know, I guess the first 15 minutes of it, it didn't look like there was going to be a lot that we were going to be able to pick about, pick out of. Uh, that and write about and talk about, but you know, toward the later half there certainly was. So, uh, I guess with that we should kind of start with 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 you know an overview of what Mike Tomlin had to say about injuries. And as mm-hmm. expected, it wasn't too terribly much. And heck, I wouldn't give out too much information right now if I were him either. With this being week one, I want the other team guessing as much as possible. Obviously, the the uh, the injury report uh, that will be released later on Wednesday will shed a little bit of light on what's going on there but uh, one guy that we know is missing practice and is going to probably be on that injury report today is Sean Davis with that ankle injury Davis did not practice during the bonus practice uh, to my understanding 
on Monday. Uh, that meant Cameron Kelly got the first team reps there at, at, at the free safety position. Uh, Mike Tomlin was asked specifically if he thinks Sean Davis will be able to play Sunday night against the Patriots. He said, I don't know. We'll see in terms of Sean Davis's availability. Uh, I like what I've seen from Cam Kelly. He's had a good preseason. I have a great deal of confidence in him. So obviously we'll be uh, we'll look to see what what happens with Sean Davis. You know, these next three days in practice, not looking great for him, but stranger things have happened. We'll, we'll you know, as Mike Tomlin says, we'll leave the light on for him. Uh, the other kind of overview that Mike Tomlin gave as far as injuries go, he said, we had a number of guys that were battling short-term injuries as the preseason came to a close, some of which we left we left in Pittsburgh as a precaution, talking about that final preseason game. Uh, we'll get some of those guys back into the fold on Wednesday and evaluate their level of participation in practice and thus their level of availability. I don't have a lot of details about some of those guys as I stand here right now. Uh, going through back through some of my notes and all, the, the short list that I could uh, come up with, Alex, would be Anthony Chicolo with a chest, uh, Ola Adani with a knee, uh, let's see, Xavier Grimble possibly with an unknown and Justin Lane with a possibly unspecified unknown injury as well, too. And of course, Sean Davis on that list. Who did I miss? Uh, the only name I would add is Bud Dupree with that thumb injury. I mean, I assume he's going to play, but I don't know, you know, if he has to be limited early in the week or something like that. The only reason I left him off was just for the sheer fact that, uh, I think he had told the reporters he was, you know, you know, uh, uh, going to be able to practice i think i saw that but uh yeah that'll okay. be a, that'll be another one to watch too uh we expect him to play though i i would mm -hmm. think at this point uh sean davis i don't know we'll we'll see you know? it doesn't sound optimistic i mean the way the tone is and we'll see i don't even we'll see what the initial injury report is but my guess early on out is he's not going to go uh get Sunday night Sunday night so there's your seventh inactive yeah uh, I wonder if Ola's going to go. He's back and he's, he's practicing in some capacity, so it sounds like there's a chance he'll play. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see if he's football ready to, to get back in there. It will be interesting to see if he's full, limited, or what on Wednesday. If he's full and can go full back-to-back, -back, mm -hmm. obviously, Wednesday and Thursday, you would think he's going to play. Now, obviously, you yep. hope hope that he's not going to play, uh, uh, have to play much right out of the shoot there with Bud Dupree and, 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 and T.J. Watt and all. But, uh, I mean, we would expect them to at least have three outside linebackers. I mean, heck, they've got five of them on their 53. You would expect four of those guys maybe to dress. Yeah, and we'll see. It's some guys that haven't played in a while. We're talking about Chick and, and Adani. Um, so if both are healthy, we'll see who the number three is. I assume it'll be Chick, but you know we'll just have to see on health. But the only guy I think that from right now that that, that is you know very very questionable to play on the night is Sean Davis. I, I'm guessing Cam Kelly's going to get the start. And what did you think about Cam Kelly's play throughout the preseason? It's been good. I think it highlights the versatility this team's looking for. I mean, this does change the dime package a little bit because I think, you know, when Davis is healthy, I believe Kim Kelly is going to become the dime defender or, or the 60B, and then Davis likely slides down in, into that dime role and Kelly plays true free safety. I think with Davis out, Cam Sutton will be that 60B and play that role, uh, which is fine. I think it's good to have that kind of depth that you can have multiple options for, for your dime package. Didn't really have that last year when Burnett was – on and off the field. Um, you know, they had Nat Burhe and Marcus Allen and stuff like that. It just, just did not go well. So um, I, I, I'm with Tomlin. I think I'm pretty confident. I, the only question I have with Kelly is just how good of an athlete is he? Can he really cover the deep half? We haven't really seen a whole lot of that good or bad. So that's the one question mark I have. I know he didn't test great coming out of college. But um, you know, his ability to cover space is the one thing that I'm. Uh, it's a bit of an unknown with him. And I think uh, one of the uh, one of the things with him also is his his under. I, I, he sounds like he's a sharp X X's and O's guys. You know, from a uh, mm -hmm. football uh, IQ standpoint, and you almost have to be boy. He you know since San, even at San Diego State played all kind of all over the place, and then obviously on into the NFL. He's at, he's asked to do a play. Pretty much all, you know, <laughs> I think every every defensive back position, you know, I think mm -hmm. you can go back between the uh, AAF, uh, the uh, his college and, and and what little he's been, you know, uh, with teams in the NFL to date that you can actually find tape of him playing every, you know, uh, every defensive back position. So I think that that versatility and it sounds like he picked up, 
you know, the playbook fairly quick. Obviously been running with the first team some since OTAs. I think that plays in his favor as well, too. Yeah, and he's even played receiver, so he has the, you know, feel of what it's like to play on the other that, side of the ball. That, too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, someone said it pretty well that the drop-off from Davis to Cam Kelly is probably one of the smaller drop-offs when we talk about starters to backups on this entire team uh, that, that you have. But but tough start for Sean Davis. But but overall, again, this team's been really healthy through this, you know, preseason. There's been no major injuries. If Davis misses, I'm guessing it's just going to be just week one. If Ola misses, I'm guessing it's going to be just week one. So I think this team's in a really good place health-wise. Do you think this – I mean, this is the healthiest team in a full – from from draft on that we've seen in years – I think so. Uh, they've had they've had some pretty good injury luck for the last couple of years, but yeah, I mean this team's in as, you know a good a shape as possible, I think. And and that's not just luck though either. I mean that's conditioning, that's overall readiness from a training standpoint, strength and conditioning standpoint, and then an individual personal standpoint. Players doing the right things, taking care of the body. So so hats off to all those guys involved. And you know the, to date, no no none of those players uh, that were banged up, obviously. Uh, look like they're headed towards IR, and that's the first time in a little while we haven't seen an early, you know, early week one, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, move from IR from uh, from the 53 to IR. Uh, look, they to me they they would have made you would think they would have made that move by now. now. Oh yeah. Now we'll talk a little bit more maybe about this tight end thing here here in a little bit here, but uh, uh, you would think I mean you would. The 53 that they have right now is probably going to be the 53 that they take to New England, and that's the first time in a long, how many years is that, has, has it been since that happened? I think 2014, if I remember doing the research the other day. So, yeah, no trades, no roster moves, no IR. It, it's been a very quiet part of the year for what typically happens with Kevin Colbert and, and, and how, you know, the late August, early September functions. Really no moves. They did try, obviously, to put that waiver claim in on Ricky Seals Jones. They went to Cleveland instead. But overall, uh, yeah, to carry that 53, I think it's the first time that's happened since 2014. And, you know, normally we talk about what this team uh, uh, will add somebody after at least a mandatory mini camp that makes the uh, the 53-man roster, and not even that happened. Uh, yeah, right. It was Ricky Manicamp when they, all those guys made it Holton and, and Skipper. So yeah, it's been, you know, I think when you have good health and you have good depth as this team does, you don't have to always make those changes. So a rare year, but a good year. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, moving forward with what, uh, what all Tomlin had to say, uh, kind of getting into you know, the, the week one thing and the week one mentality. And obviously it's tough to game plan. For a, uh, I mean, obviously you do game plan, but to to what extent do you are you able to game plan, you know, uh, uh, against mm-hmm. the team? And you know, Tomlin obviously said, look, we're going to be game planning, but uh, most of our concern right now is the uh, it, 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 with our own new, newly set 53 man roster is how we're going to divide up or, or divvy up the division of labor, uh, you know, right out of the shoot here. And you know, I think that. I, I think that's valid, uh, and obviously the questions kind of went straight toward, well, what does this mean for a guy like James Conner? You know, I mean, not James Conner, uh, uh, Dev, uh, Devin Bush. And, and I'm, I'm looking at my article saying, you know, one of the questions that we might have is, will, you know, will James Conner, uh, you know, will, how much will he play? You know, it's not a question of will he start and all, but but how much of a workload will James Conner have and how, how often will he be supplanted by a guy like Jalen Samuels? That's one of the uh, divisions of labor that will be interesting to watch. Uh, num- uh, you know, The other thing in there, obviously, with Devin Bush and all, too, is how much is he going to play? And, and, and Mike Tomlin was asked kind of specifically, you know, how, how, how is he going to balance the want to get Devin Bush on the field a lot but at the same time, not give him put too much on him on his plate, and you know he says you know we'll we'll be dis- discussing that as we develop the plan. I don't have an answer for that as I stand in here. Long term, those answers will be based on how he performs, based on the amount of work that we give him. So there's a certain element of that that won't be answered as you step into the stadium week one. But I'm comfortable with that. There's a lot of things that you can't answer on a Tuesday before you open and you hadn't been in the stadium yet. We'll know more about ourselves when we walk out of that stadium as 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 will all the other 31 teams in the National Football League. Is that just uh, is that laying low or 
do you do you believe that? No, I think there is a kernel of truth there, and this is the thing I've been saying about Devin Bush for a while now is that he's going to play a lot this year, and I think by week two he's going to basically be the guy. But whenever your first NFL test is to play against Tom Brady at Foxborough, that's a really tough matchup, even for a guy as talented and a guy that's played as well as Devin Bush has. So the number one thing to beat Tom Brady in this Patriots offense is to communicate effectively, taking care of yourself. That's how this team won last year because the defense has to be complicated and, and nuanced and, and throw a lot at you. It's the only way to try to, to defeat Tom Brady in this offense. So um, I, I've always said that I thought for week one, you might have a different division of labor um, with Devin Bush and play him a little bit less than you might the rest of the year. All right. Uh, the defense plays 60 snaps Sunday night. Mm -hmm. how, many, how much is Bush playing? How much is Bush playing? I'm just curious of how it, it's going to be based off of a package. I mean, it's not going to be just, you know, a random number. Um, I, I think he's going to play in nickel. I wonder if he's going to play in dime because that's what he's played in the preseason and in camp. Um, but reports seem to kind of indicate the other way. So I'm going to say he plays in nickel, and I'm just doing this off the top of my head right now, so don't hold me to it unless I'm right. Um, <laughs> You're learning. I'm you? not, yeah, I finally learned. <laughs> You're learning. Uh, <laughs> took to a week one of the regular season. I'm learning. Uh, I'm going to say that Bush plays only in nickel. So I'll say they'll run nickel 35 times if it's out of a 60 snap count, which I think is on the low end of things. Um so I'll put it at, at like 35 times. Okay, I'm going to take the over on that because I was on Dave Weekly's radio show on Tuesday and I chose 40. Okay. 40 snaps. So I'm 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 right there with you, brother. I'm right there with you. I think he I think you still want to get him out there quite a bit and, and yes, I think you want to get him out there uh in 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 more nickel situations if you can. But I, you know, look, I mean, that athleticism, man, you know what? I, I know it's Tom Brady. I know you kind of want to protect the kid a little bit, but damn, he's mentally strong. I, I, to me, I, you know, what gives you the best chance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Bush has value, but you have to make, you have to have the, the confidence and comfort that he can communicate it too. like people were yelling. I, I saw some stuff in my timeline that, you know, Vince Williams, you can't win with Vince Williams playing on the field. That's what happened last year. He played 59 to 62 snaps and held to this Patriots offense to, to just 10 points. So it's about communication more than it is just pure running around with your head, you know, like a chicken with its head cut off. That's kind of the way I, that I look at it. All right. What's uh, what's uh, what's a percentage of 35 versus uh, out of 60 or 40 out of 60? Uh, for me, I put him at just under 60 percent. For you, it's uh, 67 percent, two thirds right. of the time. All right, it'd be interesting to see if we're right coming right in that 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 uh, that pocket right there. My my question is though, I'm thinking in my head like, okay, if Bush is going to be kind of limited, then is is he playing in dime? And if not, who is the dime backer? Are they going to go back to Vince? I think that they did that last year. They're going to go to Barron, who hasn't done that yet. I'm just curious. I'm curious on how that's going to work. Here's the good thing. The Patriots don't have Rob Gronkowski. Mm -hmm. Or really any threat at tight end. <laughs> right, or any other threat. Uh, now, they can do some interesting things, obviously, with what? Devlin and, uh, you know. The and, running backs. And yeah. the running backs and all like that. But, uh, look, it's not as scary when, uh, especially when you look at their tight end depth chart. I would I, I would have bet you money they would have made a move by now. But, yeah. but, but they obviously have. I think it. it's like Pittsburgh where the options just suck so much. They're just like, let's just go with what we have. Right. Wait till we get some of these guys off suspension. List. So technically, you know, I think that's just a, one other thing that kind of plays into the tiny bit into the Steelers' favor here, you know? Because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're going to want to ease Bush in a little bit. Uh, and with not having that supreme weapon on, on the other side of the football there. And make no mistake about it, and we'll talk about this a little bit with, with, with Ben Volna as well, too. This is a Patriots offense that's got a few questions on it. Some late kind of shuffling around uh, and, 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 and all as well, too. And we know how Tom Brady likes that specific timing and and uh, understanding and, 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 and confidence in, in what's going on around him. I bet he doesn't have that right now, uh, This the start of this regular season, as maybe opposed to a lot of other regular seasons. Yeah, I don't know if it matters too much. Ultimately, he just goes out there and finds an open receiver, and they scheme it up so well. But I just with Bush, I mean, I get wanting to play him a lot, but – it's tough to go zero to 100 against against Tom Brady. Um, I, I think by week two, this dude's playing. Talking about Devin Bush, he's playing 90% of the time. But I think for week one, 
the most important thing is to communicate and have everyone on the same page, especially with a defense that hasn't played a lot of snaps as a unit. Even that third game, you didn't have Joe Hayden, and you you know still had some pieces missing. Um, you know, Sean Davis might not be in there uh, for this one. So I think just having the the strong communication is the most important thing for any week one, but especially when you're facing New England. I mean, think back to 2015, uh, Keith Butler's first game as defensive coordinator. The communication was terrible. They could barely get 11 guys on the field, and that's how you lost. And you had good communication week 15 last year, and, and that's really what made the difference to beat the Patriots. So that's my chief concern is to communicate effectively, get everyone on the same page, because you're going to have to really scheme this thing up to beat the Pats. And, and I don't think you need speed as much as you need the element of kind of confusion uh, to win. All right. Uh, tell the people about what uh, what Mike Thomas said about why Mason Rudolph won the number two job. Uh, well, let's actually table that for a second because we got Ben Valin coming up here in a second from the Boston Globe. So we'll talk about Rudolph and the rest of Tomlin's presser. But up next, uh, we'll talk to Ben Valin from the Boston Globe to get his thoughts on the Patriots. Okay, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. It is Wednesday, week one of the 2019 season, and everybody knows what that means. It means it's time for us to talk to a beat writer of the opposing uh, team, and that week is obvious, or this this week it's obviously the New England Patriots, and we're pleased to be joined once again. I think it's like his fifth time on the Terrible Podcast uh, uh, over the years. He's been on the show. We told him we'll probably have to get him a bobblehead or a, a uh, some sort of commemorative uh, item here uh, for this because I know he cherishes all five times he's been on this show. Uh, he's been great, however. That ha- that obviously means that we're having back on Ben Bullen, senior NFL writer from the Boston Globe. Ben, happy Wednesday. Happy week one. Happy football new year. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long offseason and a long training camp, and it's good to be back getting ready for some real football and Patriots Steelers, another great matchup to kick off the season. I think this is the fifth straight year that these teams are playing against each other. Um, the last few have been in Pittsburgh. Now we're coming back to new England where the Steelers, I don't know if they've ever beaten Tom Brady in new England. So it's going to be a, a tall task for those guys, but you know, week one, you never quite know. It was only two years ago when the Patriots had a big banner raising ceremony. And then the Kansas city chiefs came in and ran a track meet on them and, and blew them out of their own building one by 15 points. So these week one games, you never quite know what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, as you mentioned, look, Tom Brady, uh, Tom Brady in New England against the Steelers, even included, I think, the playoff games. Uh, I think, what, 5-0, and oh, uh, 18 touchdowns, zero interceptions. Uh, as, as far as that goes, I, you know, obviously Tom Brady's always great wherever he plays, but he's even greater against the Steelers uh, in, in, in Foxborough at Gillette there. Now, uh, I have been I've been you know kind of screaming since this, since the NFL schedule uh, came out that, look, if, if I had my druthers, I would rather play the Patriots in week one as opposed to having to face them like the Steelers have faced them the last couple of years, you know, later in the season, I think week 15 or so. Uh, if you had your druthers and you were the Steelers, uh, would you like to face, because of just as you laid out there, the recent, you know, the kind of hiccups that they've had uh, in, in early in the season specifically and, and week one, I guess, is that when you would most most want to play uh, Tom Brady and the Patriots if you had to choose? Yeah, no, no question. Um, and we've seen this the last several years now, um, you know, the, during this incredible run where they've made four Super Bowls in five years, they do have kind of a slow start in September. They're still figuring out their personnel. There's usually a lot of changes, especially on the offensive side of the ball. This year is no different. Uh, they don't have Rob Gronkowski anymore. That's a guy that another one who's tortured the Steelers over the years. Uh, he's no longer the big man in the middle. And so the Patriots are going to be finding out, uh, you know, how to best use their personnel. There's obviously still a lot of Julian, Julian Edelman and James White, but, um, you know, the Patriots won't have their starting center. David Andrews is out for the year now with blood clots and they have all these new receivers. Um, Demarius Thomas, Josh Gordon is back, but, uh, he hasn't been participating with the team for a while. So they're still kind of incorporating guys into the lineup and we've seen it you know last year they went down to Jacksonville week two and got beaten pretty badly and then in the next week against Detroit the Lions completely took it to them on Sunday Night Football Um, and uh, one of the hallmarks of the Bill Belichick teams is that they always get better as the season goes along and they figure out their personnel so yeah absolutely if you're the Steelers um, you know the element of surprise is tough in week one but 
this is the time to catch them, uh, the Patriots, just because they do not have their identity and they don't quite know what they have uh, with their personnel yet. When you go back to the uh, meeting between the two teams last season, though, obviously a few of these player, few players were on IR for both teams or whatnot. But a quick research of the of the Patriots current. 53 as it stands now versus the 53 players that they uh, took to Pittsburgh for that week 15 game last year. Uh, 20 are no longer on the Patriots roster, whereas that number is 13 with the Steelers. Now, once again, like I said, that's only 53 man rosters. You know, you got uh, guys like David Andrews now who's on, on, on IR because of the blood clots and a few other guys, I, I think as well too there. But do you, did you, did you, did we see the normal kind of churning of the Patriots roster uh, this offseason? And, boy, did they really churn it up a little bit late, especially with the depth on the offensive line? Uh, obviously, with, with Ted Kress having to play center now, uh, I, and I, I suppose that's who's going to start in, 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 in place of Andrews. We saw them churn it up a little bit there on the offensive line, and – <laughs> Who's? Who, I'm surprised they haven't done anything at tight end because obviously Watson and Kendrick are suspended uh, at the start of the season for them. Is this kind of the regular churning that you expected, or is it a little bit more? No, it's pretty uh, regular for the Patriots. Bill Belichick is never one to rest on his laurels, and even though they won a Super Bowl last year, they're always you know looking to improve and to upgrade certain spots. And uh, they have an unexpected hole right now at center. David Andrews getting blood clots and being out for the season, that was a major curveball for them late in training camp. And now they're scrambling a little bit. Uh, Ted Karras, I think you're right. I, I presume he'll be the starter at least to start the season. But I think the Patriots were looking to upgrade from his spot you know, before all these injuries started to happen. And they went out and they traded for Russell Bodine from the Bills, who's played a lot of games over the years for the Bengals and the Bills at center. So uh, that's going to be a, a fluid situation as they say, but um, they, there's been a lot of churn on offense. Some of it was precipitated by Gronk's retirement. Um, Trent Brown leaving in free agency. They have a new left tackle. Isaiah Wynn was a first-round pick last year, but he's also coming off a torn Achilles. That cost him his entire rookie season, so you don't quite know what you've got there. Um, wide receiver, I think the Pittsburgh game last year was Josh Gordon's last game before he got suspended. So he was, you know, it'll be Gordon and Dorsett and Edelman at wide receiver, uh, Chris Hogan is gone. They've replaced him with Demarius Thomas and some some undrafted rookies. Um, they've got another scrappy, uh, you know, uh, slot receiver. This kid Gunnar Olszewski, a uh, uh, undrafted rookie, played in Division Two, but he had a really nice camp. So a lot of churn on the offensive side of the ball, and so that you might see the Patriots struggle a little bit, you know, relatively speaking, early in the season as they figure it all out. But the defense is intact. Uh, they're bringing back pretty much everyone but Trey Flowers. Um, you know, Devin McCourty, Stefan Gilmore, Patrick Chung, Dante Hightower, uh, Lawrence Guy in the middle. Um, uh, Jamie Collins is back. They signed him to a very uh, low money deal, kind of a one-year prove-it deal. Kyle Van Noy, this is a very veteran group, the same group that shut down the Rams in the Super Bowl, had a, a really good postseason run. Um, so they're going to be counting on their defense. Uh, to be carrying this team early in the season and, and keeping them close while the offense figures it out. The one big change was they lost Trey Flowers, but they traded for Michael Bennett, and I think that's going to be a pretty even swap. Um, so while there was a lot of churn on offense, it's really the same defense back for another year, and they're going to be leaning heavily on that defense. To circle back to the offense quickly here, Ben, um, obviously the, one of the biggest changes from an outsider perspective is, is the retirement of Rob Gronkowski, trying to figure out who's going to be his replacement at tight end. Um, with some of the injuries and suspensions you guys have had for week one, who's going to step into that role, and how does this Patriots offense try to replicate you know, their potency over the middle of the field where Gronk did so much of his damage without a weapon like him? Is it Edelman? Is it someone other, someone else at tight end? I mean, how do they replace Gronkowski and what he offered middle of the field? Well, well, there's obviously no replacing him, sure. and uh, that, that was a pretty unique guy. So, and, and the Patriots say that over and over. You know, they might have some tight ends, they might have some new players, but um, they definitely don't uh, replace Rob Gronkowski. And, and they, but they really did nothing or very little in the offseason, which I was surprised at. Um, there was reports that they were interested in Jared Cook, but I think the uncertainty with Gronk at that point in time, Cook wanted uh, more of a sure thing and signed with the Saints. So they went out, the, the one guy, they, they signed Ben Watson, who again is 38 years old. So I, I don't know how much we should really count on him. And he's out for the first four weeks. Uh, and then they signed this guy, Matt Lacoste, who 
you know, maybe he's an ascending player. He's a former, like, practice squad guy for the Broncos and then became a number two tight end. But he's even battling uh, an ankle sprain suffered in the first preseason game, so we don't even know what his availability is going to be. Otherwise, it's this kid Ryan Izzo, who was a practice squad guy last year and is really just a blocking tight end. So they might go without tight ends. They might, Mm. you know, line up the fullback, James Devlin. He might be used in a lot of those type of situations. Or you could see a lot of shotgun spread. And even, you know, using James White out uh, in the slot and Rex Burkhead out in the slot, I think they're going to be using a lot of the, the, the smaller guys in the middle of the field. Uh, Gunnar Olszewski, that's who they're going to be using to, to keep the middle of the field honest. And then this year they really went out of their way and they got a lot of big six foot three, six foot four receivers on the outside, which has not been a, a part of, the, of their offense in, in recent years. They yeah. got Josh Gordon back. He's that type of receiver. Demarius Thomas. He made the 53-man roster. He's a big guy who can make those back shoulder catches. Nikhil Harry, unfortunately, the first-round pick is on IR and is going to be out for half the season. But he's a big, physical, dominant guy. So I think they're trying to replace Gronk's size and physicality with the wide receivers, not necessarily with the tight ends. But it's going to be a work in progress, and they're going to rely heavily on Edelman and James White early in the season. Can you give me a lay of the land with the offensive line? Because obviously, you know, David Andrews, that's a big loss, and that, you know, this would help bring in a guy like Bodine. But you guys traded for three offensive linemen, Corey Cunningham and another guy whose name uh, escapes me right now. I mean, can you just give me an assessment? Uh, was, was that done for to build the depth? Was there concerns about the starters? You have Isaiah Wynn. You mentioned he, you know, missed this entire rookie year. How has he looked in the preseason? You know, w- what level of play should we expect from from the starting five for the Pats? Sure, it's it's definitely more more fluid than we expected. It looked like mm-hmm. they were going to be returning four starters and then just having to replace left tackle after Trent Brown left. And you've got Isaiah Wynn, who was the 23rd overall pick last year, and you know scouts were very very high on him. Obviously, the torn Achilles it was a major uh, wrench in the plans with him, and we'll see how he does. But they they've slowly ramped him into activity this year. He he didn't do much in the first few weeks of camp. Didn't play in the first couple games, but. He's the left tackle now. They've, they've ramped up his participation. And, you know, they're not just going to leave him on, on an island. They'll give him a lot of help with tight ends and fullbacks and running backs and things like that. But I think they still are very high on Isaiah Wynn's potential, even after the, the missed uh, season. Um, you know, some injuries late in camp uh, gave them a curveball. David Andrews uh, with the lung uh, blood clots. Uh, and then they, they had a fourth-round pick, this kid out of Denmark, Yalta Froholt, who played at Arkansas. Uh, I think they were counting on him, no question, to be a backup guard center. And so he Mm -hmm. suffered a season-ending shoulder injury in the fourth preseason game. So now you're down two interior linemen. So they went out and traded for a guy from Baltimore, a a Luminor, I believe is how you you say his last name. You know, he's a backup guard. And they traded for Bodine um, as a potential starter at center or, you know, Mm -hmm. someone who can certainly provide good depth there. And then they just weren't happy with their depth at tackle. Um, in the offseason, they went out and signed Jared Valdir, a, a, a nine-year veteran with Arizona and Oakland and Denver. They went out and signed him to um, be their swing tackle and maybe even start at left tackle in case Isaiah Wynn wasn't ready to go. They gave him a – they gave Valdir a you know, $1.25 million signing bonus, and he could have made up to $6 million with incentives. It was a real deal. And he showed up for one day and said, my body just can't do this anymore, and he retired. Mm-hmm. And they never really replaced him after that. And so they, they clearly were not thrilled with their tackle depth. Uh, they gave a lot of reps to this guy, Dan Skipper. Um, but he's really just, uh, you know, they released him and put him back on the practice squad. Um, they've got a couple other guys like that. So they, you know, they went out and got this guy from um, the Cardinals, who was an undrafted rookie last year, but he started six or seven games and has some real experience, I think, playing left tackle. So uh, it's a little bit of a desperation move because I think they just didn't like their depth behind Isaiah Wynn because as high as they are on Wynn right now, they still don't quite know what they're going to get out of him. Yeah, but if Dante Skarnecchia says that's the guy he wants. <laughs> that, that's... Well, so, so let me add to that. They, you know, they, as, as you said, they have Dante Skarnecchia. He's the best coach in the business. And they still uh, left guard Joe Tooney, right guard Shaq Mason, and right tackle Marcus Cannon are all returning. And those guys are very solid. Um, dependable players um, but still you know the, the offensive line we've seen with the Patriots in the past it's kind of like the rest of the offense sometimes in the first few weeks it's not always so pretty and it takes them a little bit to get their communication down having a new center is a, a, a big question mark that that's a you know the center in today's NFL I think is equally important as a left tackle and so losing a dependable guy like D- David Andrews who's a team captain 
that's a tough loss for them, and that's not one that we should minimize. So um, they they definitely have the pieces to be a, a very good to great offensive line, but um, what looked like a, a dominant part of the team has certainly taken some big hits in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, really, my, my uh, name and Dante Skarnecchia, there was more of the fact of, boy, those had to be a couple of guys that he really had his eye on and looked uh, you know, closely at to, for them to go out and get last minute of that. But you did kind of cover where I was going to go. And my next question there is, look, Tom Brady likes his wide receivers. You know, if, if it's if it's a if it's a you know, a, a 12 yard, uh, you know, route you know, that that breaks in. You know, at, at 11 feet, 8 inches, he wants it at 11 feet, 8 inches, you know. Uh, and, and you got all these, obviously, he, uh, what I'm getting at is the preciseness of Tom Brady that we know and have learned over the years. This is, and he, he's got to be OCD to some degree. This has got to be driving him crazy right now with with the change at center. Kind of, you know, how much trust does he have at the left tackle position? Uh, let's face it, uh, 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 with Gordon... You know, ha- ha- being away for a lot of the, you know, for, for most of the offseason there. Uh, you got a new guy in, in, in Demarius Thomas that hadn't been around all that much. You got a, a, a young rookie uh, on that wide receiver staff. You don't really, they uh, most of the tight ends looked like they were banged up, for, you know, most uh, most of the preseason too. This is this has got to be driving him crazy. You know, when you, when you frame it like that, uh, maybe, but, you know, Brady, this is, his 20th year now and this is business as usual for the Patriots they always seems like for the last you know set probably most of this decade they always have new receivers they're trying to work in they always have changes on the offensive line and in 2014 they traded away Logan Mankin you know one of their leaders and captains they traded him to the Bucks like a week before the regular season and everyone was upset and and Tom Jackson's going on TV and saying they've lost respect for Belichick and they get blown up by Kansas City, and then they go on and win the Super Bowl that year. So um, this is it's business as usual for the Patriots, and that's this is how football operates. I mean, yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate that David Andrews is out for the year, but that's you know an injury that no one could see coming, and um, you know it was unfortunate that Josh Gordon got suspended all of a sudden last year, but it, those things happen in the NFL. Guys are suddenly out and they can't play, and you have to be able to adjust. And frankly, I think few few people in the NFL in today's modern game are better at adjusting on the fly and adapting to whatever the situation is than Brady, Belichick, McDaniels. These guys are very, they, they know that all their plans are in pencil and things have to be able to change all the time. And they come up with solutions very well. So uh, yes, I think Brady is, you know, is concerned about working all his receivers and, but you know, he's also, you know, Demarius Thomas is a veteran guy that he's working with now, a real professional receiver. Same with Philip Dorsett, Julian Edelman. These guys are pros. Ben Watson, he's a pro. He's not, he doesn't have too many kids that he's working with and that he has to yell at and, and teach them how the NFL way is. So I, I think Brady's okay with the way things are going right now with the offense. And obviously with this defense, as you already hit on, not not a whole lot of really change. I mean, Trey Flowers, you know, uh, if the Patriots, Patriots usually have a good sense of no kind of when to let some of those key defensive guys uh, run off, uh, r- you know, run off to free agency there. And, you know, we'll see if that happened again with Trey Flowers here. But they did bring in a, 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 a really proven guy in Michael Bennett. I think they let uh, that um, uh, Malcolm, uh, uh, who was it, Malcolm Thomas, I think, uh, go, go off. To, or Malcolm, Malcolm Brown. Malcolm Brown. Uh, go off to the Saints, I think, during the offseason. But as you said, Jamie Collins, a guy that you know spent <laughs> started his career there in New England, uh, ran off to Cleveland or traded off to Cleveland for two and a half years, and now he's back. Now, one guy we haven't talked a lot about yet or any about yet. Uh, look, the Steelers have their own rookie defensive player uh, in, in in Devin Bush, but <laughs> well, Alex and I watched a ton of tape on Chase Winovich, and really, you had no choice but to if you're watching tape on uh, Devin Bush to watch tape on Chase Winovich because he flashed that much on tape. You know, there were a lot of Steeler fans that were upset that uh, that Chase Winovich, you know, obviously a local kid, didn't land uh, uh, with the Steelers there. But with, with that said, boy, the Patriots made the sec- were, were probably the, the, the second team on the list where you could see that guy uh, show up. How is he? I mean, uh, I've seen a little bit of him, obviously, during the preseason there. You've seen a lot more of him than we have. How is that? How is that? That kid's going to be a stud, isn't he? Uh, certainly was a quintessential Patriots pick. You know, the kid is all about football. 
really smart and, and I think is good with the Patriot way as far as uh, knows the, the right answers to give uh, to the media and, and what, like I remember his first um, teleconference after being drafted, someone asked him, uh, yeah, when you're in college, you can play on this side of the ball or that side of the ball. And he's like, I need to check with my team to make sure if I can answer that. So <laughs> he's already, you can tell he's the perfect, he's the perfect uh, Patriot. Um, and he's had a great camp. He's played like his hair's on fire. Um, I think it was the second preseason game when they played, uh, Tennessee, he dominated that game. He was all, you know, all over the backfield, several sacks. I don't have his stats in front of me, you know, off the top of my head, but he had a very good preseason going to be an edge defender linebacker you know de- uh, defensive lineman one of these hybrid type players like a rob ninkovich you know really need him to set the edge um the patriots they don't believe in the pure pass rushers like the, the jj watts and the von millers i mean obviously those guys are tremendous players but the patriots believe that they can they, they don't want to pay premiums for those players and they believe that they can scheme up uh, a lot of their pressure up front and so they've got a lot of versatile guys that maybe aren't going to win a ton of one-on-one battles up front, but uh, they got uh, very aggressive with their blitzes and zone blitzes and, you know, disguising who's dropping and who's rushing last year uh, towards the end of the season. They, and, you know, and you saw in the Super Bowl, they confused the heck out of the Rams. And so I, you know, I just think Winovich is going to be a really valuable piece uh, for them. Just, you know, probably a rotational piece at first, but he's a guy that I think can do a lot for them. He's good very sound in the run game. He can get after the passer a little bit. He can drop off and play some underneath zone coverage. Um, So Winovich is just like that good, versatile, smart player that the Patriots always covet. My last question for you, Ben. Uh, I'm a special teams nerd. I love talking about that element of it. I know you guys still have Gostowski, a kicker for, seems like, forever now. But your punter changed. You had Ryan Allen, who had a great, you know, long career with the Patriots. You have, what, Jake Bailey, now the rookie from, I believe, Stanford. I, I heard he had a great camp. I haven't watched any of him. Um, how good of a camp did he have to push Allen out? And is he going to be a real weapon for, for you guys this year? Well, as, you know, when, when a punter gets drafted in the fifth round, as the Patriots did with Jake Bailey, I mean, he's going to make the team. Uh, mm-hmm. So the question really was whether Belichick was going to keep, you know, kind of three kickers. One of the, Bailey would be more of a specialist than a, the full-time punter. But um, it's funny. There's a, a weird disconnect with Ryan Allen that I can't quite figure out. I thought he had a, a, a solid year last year. Look, he doesn't have the biggest leg, but the Patriots, I think precision is more important for them because they're punting from midfield all the time. Right. Uh, so I thought he had a good year and he was basically the MVP of the Super Bowl, had a phenomenal game. And then he goes out in free agency, gets zero interest, signs a one-year, basically minimum deal with the Patriots with only 100000 guaranteed. And I'm just wondering, why does the NFL not value Ryan Allen? I thought he was a good punter, but he just did not have much interest out there. And uh, Bailey, you know, much bigger leg, um, can do kickoffs as well. Goskowski is now 35 years old. I think the Patriots will probably want to um, save Goskowski a little bit. Kickoffs can actually be kind of taxing on a kicker when you're just trying to, you know, bomb the ball through the end zone Mm -hmm. every time Um, and a lot of kickers when they get up into their late 30s they stop kicking off as much so Bailey has the skills to do that as well and the biggest story in all of this is that Jake Bailey is a right-footed punter which is this is the first time in Belichick's 20 years that he's not had a (laughs) left-footed punter that's always been his thing so they finally have a right-footed guy and I think that maybe that in and of itself (laughs) tells you how much they like Jake Bailey Ben, you've obviously done this for a long time. Heck, I remember, I think, having you on when you covered the Dolphins and all. I mean, uh, you're one of the most respected guys. You're not hot takey. You do your homework. Uh, you're the kind of guy that we'd like to have on this podcast that, that fits in well with our listeners. You're not a homer. You don't have the homer aspect to, to you as well, too. So this next question, at, at, covering the you know the NFL and the Patriots and, and, and obviously uh, uh, the Steelers because of uh, them being an opponent over the years, what do you make of this team from the end of last season until now? Uh, you know, a lot less drama with this team. Yes, they lost two fa- fantastic uh, skill players on the offensive side of the ball. One, however, didn't play at all last year, Le'Veon Bell. But Antonio Brown's a loss no matter how you look at it. Yeah, the, the drama uh, you could do without. With all that said and all that you know for, that's transparent Inspired since the end of last season until now. What is your outsider 30,000 view of the 2019 Steelers? 
Yeah, sure. I, I was going to say, it seems like um, there's been a lot of singing Kumbaya in training camp this year. Just no drama. Everyone's on the same page. I think Juju Smith-Schuster at the beginning of camp had a, a great, you know, he, he went out and said, you know, we're all about the team now. And um, you can, you can tell they, they've, you know, moved on from Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell and um, the Steelers. It's weird to say they, they are almost an afterthought in during training camp. There are just so many other stories going on in the NFL and uh, without, with, with the Brown and the Bell drama finally gone, it seems like a lot of the media attention has, has moved on. And I think if you're the Steelers, you're okay with that. You're, you're lying in the weeds a little bit. Um, I know the, everyone's hyping the Browns, but I just can't get over the fact that they're still the Browns and you're still the Steelers. And so I still think uh, even after losing those two phenomenal players, the Steelers have more than enough talent to um, win the division. And so the Steelers are going to be my choice to win the AFC North again. I think Juju is going to have a big year. Uh, the Steelers always crank out. It seems it always seems to crank out these wide receivers. So I'm not too worried about, um, you know, not having Antonio Brown anymore. I still think big Ben is near the top of his game might be sliding a little bit, but still an elite level quarterback. Um, now there's pressure. I, you know, the Steelers are a weird organization in that I think if there were any other team, Mike Tomlin would have been on the hot seat a long time ago. I don't know how Art Rooney feels about that. I mean, maybe Tomlin's still the coach for 20 more years. I got to think after missing the playoffs last year and having some disappointing seasons that there's a lot of pressure in the building and that there might be some hot seats, especially when you don't extend uh, Colbert is, you know, I think in a walk year and, and the GM, he, he didn't want to extend his contract. So I, there could be some changes coming. But I think the, the Steelers are primed for another good year, and I still think that they're going to be the best uh, team to beat in the AFC North. All right, with that, uh, week one prediction. Uh, uh, you, you've, never been, <clears throat> you've never been shy about making these. So Sunday night at Foxborough at Gillette Stadium, unfurling that, uh, that, uh, you know, another championship banner. Uh, what, you know, what's going to happen here? What's, who's going to win this one? What's going to be, what's going to be the final score? Yeah, you know, I think if we go rewind the tape to last year, I think I did take the Steelers to win in uh, Pittsburgh against the the Patriots. So this is no homer pick, but uh, definitely picking the Patriots in this one. Uh, I just, for whatever reason, they just, you know, torture you guys in Foxborough at at Gillette Stadium. Um, It might be a closer game. The spread's five and a half, I think. I'm, I'm taking the Patriots to cover. I think they'll win. 31 21 something like that uh it, you know it'll be a banner night for the patriots as they raise their sixth banner and um it'll be interesting for the steelers you guys for so long have been the class of the nfl with the six titles and now the patriots have tied to and now it's a, a race for seven so uh it's very fitting that these two teams i think kick off the season on sunday night football and uh you know i do as much as i do like the steelers still in the AFC north i, I think they'll have a tough time on sunday night uh, Patri- Patriots gonna, I mean, Patriots gonna be back in the uh, AFC Championship game, right? I uh, in the AFC Championship game, yes. I actually, I guess uh, I'm predicting a rematch because I am taking the Chiefs to go to the Super Bowl, and I'm I think I'm taking the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl too. So uh, I just think the Chiefs are out for blood this year, out for revenge. They were six inches lining up all sides away from going to the Super Bowl last year, and I think they've improved their defense a lot. I think Frank Clark's going to be a tremendous addition for them. So, yeah, Patriots, Chiefs, AFC Championship game, and then uh, Andy Reid and the Chiefs finally getting it done. Ben, let's do this again in the playoffs, okay? Uh, let, let, you know, sometime in the playoffs. Uh, in the meantime, though, Ben, we certainly do appreciate your time. Folks, you can follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Volan. That's V O. L I N. You can read his work at the Boston Globe. Uh, you can go to his Twitter feed and find a direct link to uh, his stories on the Boston Globe. Uh, make sure you reach out to him and thank him for being on the on the terrible podcast as well. Ben, thank you for being on the show again. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for always and uh, enjoy the game this Sunday. Should be a lot of fun. And thanks again to Ben Volin from the Boston Globe. Again, follow him at Ben Volin, B-O-L-I-N. Dave, uh, had him on for a long time now. Uh, always gives that really level-headed perspective that uh, I certainly appreciate. Yeah, I tell you, and, and the thing that I that that I, I kind of 
try to pat myself on the back with over the years, man, we have some great uh, guys, you know, beat writers over the years that we've developed relationships uh, with on, on this show that to come on and uh, it just feels good to be able to pick you know, uh, uh, on a moment's notice, send an email and say, hey, can you come on the show and preview this game? And now, boy, we've got a quite quite a uh, black book built up when it comes to this. And Ben's Ben's one of the best there is when it comes to the Patriots there. And hopefully the uh, the listeners enjoyed that uh, that nearly 30 minute talk with him. Yeah, it'll be a good one. Um, like Ben said, for for Sunday night, we'll talk. We'll preview that game more in depth for you and I on, on Friday show as we usually do. To jump back into what Tomlin said, I know before we we talked to Ben, um, Dave, you asked about you know Tomlin, what compelled him to name Mason Rudolph as a number two, and it's not a surprise. Obviously, he just played better, but specifically. Tomlin Tuesday was asked um, what Rudolph did, and Tomlin said, quote, he took very good care of the ball. He showed the natural maturation process that we expect from second-year players. First of all, he showed up in great physical condition. He showed a guy who's been a lap around the track in that regard, and it set the stage for a more consistent performance. He went on to say, quote, I think he's grown a lot in terms of his understanding of how we attack people and his role in the offense, and I think it showed in his play. All those reasons are are why um, he's the backup quarterback, Tomlin did give the caution of these things are fluid and that job's not locked in. And if he falters, Dobbs is is waiting in the wings. But again, no surprise there. But I thought that the assessment of Rudolph taking care of the football, getting sacked less, um, just making more positive plays is, is the driving reason why he's number two this year. And also when it comes to Chris Boswell, uh, he was asked, you know, you know, what did Boswell do to win the job? And he, he, he focused on the consistency aspect with Boswell, saying he asked you know, us, he, he did everything we asked him to do in the situations and whatnot that we put him in and all like that. Now, look, I, I don't think, I don't I don't know where you're at on Bo- Boswell right now. I I thought he could have been tested a little bit more. Look, you you told us, and, and we knew right at the start of a uh, training camp that Matthew Wright was not going to, it, it was not going to be Matthew Wright. It was either going to be Chris Boswell or somebody else. You had to think that the coaches knew that as well, too. You know, was the was the mere presence of Matthew Wright enough of a uh, you know pressure thing? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure Boswell uh, you know formed a pretty decent relationship with Matt Wright, or, or Matthew Wright over the time he was there. But I, I wonder at any time did 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 uh, Boswell think. This guy isn't taking my job. Uh, now, Boswell uses the cliche, look, I, it was never about me against against anybody else. It's always been against me and me making my my mm-hmm. kicks. And, and, and I, do the, I do buy that to some degree. Should they have brought in a tougher combatant for him and didn't, did not did anything? Now you did talk about you know how Boswell made a lot of you know all of his kicks during during training camp and all, but there's something to me that happens between being out there, you know at at, at, at La Trobe at St. Vincent College and being on you know in the stadium, uh, uh, go go you know field goal team get out there you know and be asked to kick you know 48 yard field goal or something on the spot. Did did do you think they handled that competition right? I thought they were. I thought it was fine. Um, there was pressure on Boswell no matter what because he's fighting for his job. He's fighting for that roster bonus. He's basically fighting for his NFL career. So I'm sure he was under tremendous pressure just on every kick, even in camp, but especially in stadiums, just because he knew what it meant. Even if it wasn't going to be Matthew Wright, he knew it could be somebody else. He knew that the margin of error was pretty thin. And and while yeah, it would have been nice to see him try to boot some some really long 50 plus yard field goal. For me, I think when it comes to Boswell, it's not about can he hit the 50-yarder. It's can he hit three straight from 40 yards out. You know, Can he show that consistency? So it's more of a volume thing. Did he get enough kicks to show that he can be consistent? Because that was the number one thing you needed to see with him. And I thought they got a good volume of kicks. He had about 30 field goal attempts in camp, maybe a little bit more. Um, what did he kick? Four, four or five? Uh, well, probably, what, three field goals and four or five extra points in the preseason. So I thought you had just enough of a sample size to have comfort with Chris Boswell that he can be consistent. So I thought that was the biggest thing he needed to show. And I thought he did. Uh, with, uh, the $2 million (laughs) roster bonus, but that, that, that does put some pressure on you. I'm sure. Yeah. That's a good incentive. So I I don't think you need a Matthew Wright to to have that kind of pressure. How how worried, how worried are you about him to, 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 to start the season? 
I mean, I'll admit I'm still a bit worried because, you know, this time last year, like Boswell didn't implode until the regular season started last year. His preseason in 2018 was fine. I'll have to go back and look at the numbers, but no one was worried about Chris Boswell. He wasn't shaky. It wasn't, okay, you know, we might be in for a long season until you actually start a game to the count. So you never know how it's going to go once the games count because obviously that's a another level of pressure that's going to be associated with any kicker. And that first miss you know, the, the whispers, not going to be whispers, they're going to be, you know, you're going to hear some 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 boo birds potentially. So uh, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't think the team knows how this is going to go. But I thought overall Boswell gave you the best body of work to say, you know, we're comfortable enough to give it another, another, another shot. Here's the thing. They, you know, they made the decision now. <clears throat> the bet has been uh, the bet's been made. They're going to sleep in it for at least four weeks, right? You're hanging out with Tomlin a little bit, haven't you? <laughs> the bed's been made. They're going to sleep in it for four weeks. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, you're going to. It's not. It's going to be a short leash, but it's not going to be one bad game. It's going to get him cut. Right. It's not going to be bomb at New England. Out the door he goes. However, mm-hmm. comma, as I like to say, if we get in through the, uh, I like to call it the the Josh Scobie window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we get into that week four or five range there and. Maybe a missed kick or something in week four, week five winds up costing you the game. You're not, you're, you're not going to just – the rosary only helps you so much. Yeah, they're not committed to this guy, even after paying that roster bonus. You know, you need a kicker that can win, and that's going to be the difference between a su- successful and an unsuccessful season. You're going to make a change. So, like, they're not committed to Basel, you know, if he struggles. And if he does struggle, then, yeah, you're probably going to have to move on. But hopefully we don't get to that point. You know <clears> – <throat> We, and, and I think you've detailed this in a post in the past, how some, some kickers have, uh, it was either you or Daniel, have overcome some tough times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, I wrote about it uh, a couple months ago. And, and you know, look, it, that you know, it happens. <clears throat> kickers, so you know, nearly all the great kickers will go through a tough spell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let, me, let me pull, or go ahead, I'll, I'll pull up the article. Uh, and, oh, I, and, and while you do that, I, I mean, these guys are, these guys are funny birds, man. You know, yep. I, I keep saying that and you know, I don't have any really uh, a hard, <clears throat> hard data to back that up. But these kickers sometimes are, 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 are funny birds when it comes to this. And the way his kind of demeanor has changed, you know, this this was kind of a happy go lucky kid. I thought when they first uh, brought him in, you know, all bright eyed and bushy tailed. And and when things were going good, boy, they, they were going good. Uh, you watch it. Uh, uh, I kind of cringe now when I watch his sessions with the media, you know, uh, he, he just kind of has become since going through that rough, rough spell and all and, and, and having to answer questions about his roster bonus. He just I, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm worried about him. I'll put it to you that way, Alex. I mean, I, I can be worried, too, and I understand that. Yeah, the study I did back in was at late May. Um, I looked at 17 kickers from 01 to 2017 um, that had at least 15 field goal attempts and the sub-70 field goal percentage the way the Boswell did last year. Actually, there were 21 kickers. I apologize. Um, and on average, or, or 17 of those 21, I should say, uh, saw their field goal percentage increase by over 15% the next year. Uh, five went up by 20%. So Boswell can go from 65 to 85%. Um, you could have uh, obviously a, a, what I would consider a bounce back year. So there's precedent there before. Like you said, there's been good kickers that have had bad years and then have really bounced back. Neil Rackers, Ryan Longwell, Ryan Lindell in the early 2000s were some of the best kicker, kickers in football. Mason Crosby, Greg Zerline, um, Graham Gano, who's still in the league, Sebastian Janikowski. So th- there's been a, there's a history of kickers that have struggled and then been able to bounce back. So it is possible. Unfortunately, it's unpredictable. And that's always the tricky part with kicker. Okay. Uh, Mike Tomlin also, boy, he, he, like you said, like we said at the start of the show, he was, uh, he was in, he, in the pocket, so to speak, uh, when it came to his references and all, uh, he, you know, talking about, uh, uh, Javon Hargrave, who right now still doesn't have a contract extension. It doesn't look like there's going to be a contract extension. I think Hargrave kind of admitted as much. Look, he's just ready, prepared to go in and have another great season here and then let things take care of themselves afterward. That's exactly the attitude that he should have. You know, look, the selfish part of us, I think you and I get, get this, mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. pay pay the man. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen as we sit here you know, a few days before week one starts here. But, uh, you know, Mike Tomlin made it very clear that even though the <clears throat> the Steelers are not giving him a con or doesn't look like they're going to give uh, Hargrave a contract extension, that he was pleased with Hargrave's training camp and his preseason and, and that the defensive tackle will continue to see more snaps this year in the team's sub package defense. Uh, due to you know how he's kind of increased his position flexibility, i.e., being able to be a pass rusher uh, in, in you know out of sub packet situations, and Tomlin said I thought he had a solid performance in camp in the preseason. Uh, I like how he continues to add to his portfolio. I often kid him, and uh, boy, you want to talk about old school term here? A, yeah. a nose guard is like boy. Uh, it seemed like the last time. Uh, we used nose guard was when blockbuster was started. Uh, but, <laughs> but he says often kid him a nose guard is like blockbuster video. He better diver- diversify. Uh, a nose doesn't get an opportunity to play much. So he better reinvent himself as a sub package rusher. And he has done that over the last couple of years because, uh, because of that challenge. And thus he's made himself more useful to us. Now he goes on to say that it won't matter uh, really how the Patriots offense decides to attack the Steelers defense on first down Sunday night, because he was asked a question kind of related to that uh, in regard to Hargrave and when he might see the field. Uh, Tomlin went on to say, so it doesn't matter whether or not he's a major uh, component on first down or if they choose to play in that mode, meaning more of a running game, I suppose. Tomlin said uh, he still has an opportunity to contribute in our efforts. He still has an opportunity to impact the game because of how he's developed as a sub package rusher. But there's any one thing that stuck out really last year with, with Javon Hargrave. It was how he developed as a sub package pass rusher. And that's why so many people right now are clamoring to, to pay the man mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to this. Uh, what Tomlin did, if you had a lie detector uh, uh, machine hooked up to him, he did not tell any lies when it came to Javon Hargrave yesterday. No, I mean, you, there was nothing to disagree with there. Six and a half sacks with Hargrave last year are not a lot of opportunities. I mean, Stephon Tewitt's career high in sacks is six and a half, and Hargrave did that on 43. about... 43.5% of all defensive snaps played last season, and you got to know that not all of those 43.5% snaps were passing downs. Yeah, it's probably like half of that is probably passing downs. So, I mean, he just, he, he was efficient. He's one of the most efficient, pa- efficient pass rushers on this team, but I don't know how good it is for Tomlin to talk about, talk to a 26 year old about blockbuster. I don't think Hargrave <laughs> knows what a nose guard or a blockbuster is. So I think he's just confusing the man, but no, I mean, it, you have to be versatile and what Hargrave gives you with his effort, his motors come a long way from where it was in college. He plays with the same motor and intensity down and down that Hayward and Tewitt does. And even he can do stuff in the run game too. The Steelers love to run these run stuff with a little slant, you know, Hayward or two into the A gap and, and, and have Hargrave loop around to help, you know, hit the C gap and, you know, things that you just normally can't do with bigger or mobile nose tackles. You can do it to Von Hargrave. You can really mess up blocking schemes with the stunting they do in the run game and then even in the pass game, you can scoop and contain if you want to run an inside linebacker blitz or an outside linebacker crashing in, whatever you want to do. So he offers you a lot of versatility. It's the reason why I want to keep him. Obviously, he's a tremendous pass rusher and it continues to grow. Um, unfortunately, though, what makes him so great makes him so expensive, too, and the reason why he's probably going to be playing for somebody else in 2020. Right, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how much, you know, how, you know we talked to, to to Ben Bullen there, and, you know, there, there's a decent shot, you know, decent chance that maybe they go a lot of four wides, you know, mm-hmm. uh, try to st- spread this Steelers defense out. We'll get more down into the X's nose and the breakdown into Friday's show there, but uh, <laughs> this guy's poised to have a, a monster season, is he not? Yeah, I mean, part of it is tethered to the snap count. You know, I mean, it is going to be tough to hit six and a half sacks again if he's only playing just over 40% of the time. Obviously, an injury to two or Hayward could really open the door for more play time. But if those guys stay healthy, it may really cap him. And again, that's been the issue with trying to pay the man the money he deserves um, when he knows he can go somewhere else, play a lot more, and obviously get paid a lot more. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this guy's, for my money, one of the best nose tackles in football and has such a, such a unique skill set that's uncommon. Um, and that's going to make him even more difficult to replace because it is hard to find that interior lineman that can stand up against the run, play with great effort, be scheme versatile, and, of course, get after the quarterback. 
Uh, boy, you got to try to rotate him in more, I think. You know, give you guys some breathers, mm-hmm. you know. And, and that seems to be Dunbar's goal, to keep these guys at least fresh for the end of the year. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it can be tough sometimes. And, and, look, I mean, it looks like Toots the healthiest maybe he's been at the start of the season for a while, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you need Tuit to have a great year, too. I mean, that's the thing. You Hayward's your stud, so you don't want to take him off the field. Tuit, you're paying him a lot of money. You want him to have that great year, so it's – you know, obviously it's a good problem to have, but you don't, in a way, want to take either of those guys off the field. Yeah, and, you know, the, the way that sub package football is nowadays, it's going to be hard to have all three of them on the field, except, mm-hmm. you know, early in game rundown situations more than likely there. So to be, yeah. you know, uh, all right, what else do we have to talk about that, that, well, that Tom? Well, I, had? I, I just wanted to mention with, with the Hargrave talk that Tom also talked about, you know, Dan McCullers needing to be diversified too. I wonder what, what, what does that mean with McCullers? I mean, he's not, he's a, he's like the old 1980s camcorder, just this big dude you carry around on your shoulder that just does, just does one thing. Yeah. The old Betamax <clears throat> that was that before that you is? were born. Yeah, I just remember my mom every Christmas would have like the giant, like had to put on a chair the camcorder because it was too heavy to try to carry you around. That was that's Dan McCullers. We had eight millimeter back when I was mean, you know, the old. I don't know eight, any. Eight. I don't know any of those <laughs> things, Dave. You're you're, you're blockbuster me. Here. Stuff stuff like the Zabruder film was filmed. <laughs> Are you the Babushka lady, Dave? <laughs> uh, look, you know me. I like to I like to get those Zabru, those Zabruder type uh, uh, clips going uh, during mm-hmm. the season. There, slow things down, go frame by frame, <laughs> uh, that that kind of stuff. But no sound eight millimeter is how a lot of my early childhood Christmases were uh, uh, were were. Uh, were film there uh okay moving on uh where, where, where'd you just leave us off at uh just talking about tomlin and hargrave that's i think that was the bulk of what tomlin said in the presser that that was notable rudolph um hargrave talked about the injury report um i think that was about it yeah no, no tight ends being brought in uh, you know obviously they attempted to claim ricky seals jones but i think this team just just decided that the market is so poor i i Let's have just... i uh, i'd like to speak uh, i got my hand up i'd like to uh, i'd like to uh address <laughs> the uh... floor recognizes <laughs> <Dave Bryan. laughs> from, from from the great state of uh no, nevada uh <laughs> all right you know, all that's out there right now is probably some some established kind of veteran guys, if you will. Uh, you know, they they obviously did try to claim uh, claim a younger guy in in, in, in Ricky Sills Jones. I is there a chance that they're because of of uh, veteran guys if they're on a roster uh, week one have their contracts fully guaranteed? Could we see a situation where next week? Maybe a guy like Luke Wilson is brought in, or do you think uh, Ricky Seals Jones was just too good of a guy to to prevent them from uh, from trying to upgrade, you know, their their roster at that you know at the tight end position there? That you know they'll they'll just play it by ear, so to speak, moving forward. Or do you think as soon as this week one game's over and 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 these vested guys no longer have their full their contracts? fully guaranteed that we could see a guy brought in right right away here uh yeah i i if they bring somebody in it's possible but it's not going to be because of the whole vested veteran guaranteed contract thing i don't think steelers play that game too much i think if they do make a change it's just going to be that continued evaluation of the tight end group and let's put gentry into a regular season game and see how he does and if we're not happy with his level of play then we'll make a move for that so i think it'll be just totally driven by the on-field product nothing to do with the whole financial commitment to a best veteran uh make make no mistake about it luke wilson is an attractive guy i think i mean look he is what he is he's not the player that he was for all those years you know with uh uh with seattle but uh yeah not not definitely not a bad number three you know i and, and you know i think could be really a decent uh number two now you know grimble does give you bless grimble grimble's never going to live i mentioned this a couple of weeks ago this guy is now he wears the uh fitzgerald toussaint mm-hmm. uh scarlet letter on him you know yep. this guy will never be i don't know what it would ever take right now at this point for this guy to get you know to get back in good graces with you know, half more than half of of of, of Steelers Nation. Uh, he look, he is what he is though on that. You know, he has developed as a run blocker over the years. But I mean, he he is what he is. But I mean that that fumble against the Broncos last year, people are not going to be able to move on from that that ever, no matter how good of the game mm-hmm. that he has. And now he's supposedly banged up uh, on 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 top of it. 
you know, well, look, we talked about this tight end position all off season, Alex. You know, thinking that for, for sure that if there was going to be a move and we thought there'd be one made, that it'd be at the tight end position. But here we are. They haven't done it. Uh, there, there's other teams out there looking for tight ends, too. The market's not great. Are they going to add? You know, does does a lot of it depend on what happens in week one? Yeah, and again, I think it just depends on, on how the group performs. And, and, and that's where I was going to go with the Grimble talk is that, listen, I, I was interested in Luke Wilson as a number three. I mean, if they did that, that would have been fine. But I think the fan base gets sometimes too fixated on players outside the organization where it's just Luke Wilson, got to have Luke Wilson, have to have Luke Wilson. Why aren't they signing Luke Wilson? Just because it's, it's new. Just because it's new. I mean, we talked about it. I'm not pretending like we haven't talked about it. I mean, again, I was interested in it, but I'm a, I know it's not going to make or break the season, and I get why they're not signing with signing him, and I can live with you that. You always was, think the guy on the outside yeah, is better than always, the guy that you yeah. have in there. Right, right. And let's, let's be clear about one thing is that Luke Wilson is not better than Xavier Grimble. And there's probably a lot of pearl clutching when I just said that to the people maybe, listening Maybe here. as a blocker. Ah, I'd have to, I don't know. Grimble has made a lot of strides as a blocker. He's really improved. And so Grimble is frustrating, and yeah, his potential is, is high, and he's never really come close to that. And I'm not even saying that he's the best number two, but he is a better player than this fan base gives him credit for because, as you said, he's going to be forever attached to that fumble against Denver just in the way that Fitzgerald Toussaint was. So, you know, I, I can I, – I, you have to kind of – balance it enough and not overcorrect while Grimble's not great. He's not nearly as bad as I think the fan base makes him out to be. Here's the thing, though, too, man. If you believe everything that's out there, Vance McDonald's going to play right around the same amount of snaps that he played last year. I kind of foresee it a little bit more, but we'll see how the, how the numbers come. I mean, we, know, we knew all along that Vance McDonald was never going to be an every-down guy. Heck, right. I mean, hey, you can't afford to do that anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, uh, uh, and he's no heat, you know, no Heath Miller from a durability standpoint. I mean, you have to manage him. And we also know that this team likes to run a lot of two tight end personnel groupings. And you know how I feel about throwing a tackle out there as many times. I don't mind occasionally doing it, but as much as the Steelers did it last year, I'm not a fan of that. I like to at least have a guy out there that can catch the damn football to give you an option when 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 it when it comes to that. Uh, you know, I just Grimble and Gentry right now, especially in the running game aspect, just does not light my fuse. You know, I think it'd be lit a little bit more if if you had a guy like like Luke, Luke Wilson in there. You know, who, who do you I, think Wilson's better than Grimble? I think he is. I I look. It's not. It's not. It's not a huge huge. Look, he would have a job. You know, I, 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 I hate to use that 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 easy way out. You know, Luke Wilson probably should have have a job if he was as in good as that area as, as one of the top, you know, say a Matt Spath years ago. You mm-hmm. know, kind of, kind of, he's not Matt Spath, okay? But I do I think uh, do I think there's a noticeable difference in the run blocking between Wilson and, and Grimble the last time I checked the tape? Yeah. See, I, I'm not there. I think Grimble is better than any free agent option that exists right now. I'm not saying it's a lot better. A, as an all-around guy, I, I agree. Yeah, and I'm not saying that Grimble even is, is ideal as a number two. I mean, when they put that tender on him, I, I kind of winced a little bit because I thought that was a little too pricey. I thought you could have re-signed him to a, to a cheaper deal. But fine, I know why they, they did it because they were losing Jesse. They didn't want to lose both guys. But, um, yeah, I, I, I just want to look at Grimble in a little different light because – he can make plays. He can be a vertical threat. I think there's been improvement as a blocker, um, and I don't want to you know, be forever attached to that fumble as bad as it was, and it was terrible and you know, awful play, no no bones about it. But I think the fan base has overcorrected too much and said this guy sucks, he can't play, and I just simply disagree with that assessment. I mean, but 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 you have to admit, you'd much rather see at least early in the season here uh, out, of, uh, out, out of two tight end personnel groupies, you'd much rather see uh, – Grimble and Luke Wilson than you would uh, Grimble and Zach Gentry or Grimble and Chiquama Corfor. 
Well, like I said, I, I was fine. I, I was searching for a number three tight end over Gentry just because he is raw. And there's been, it was a decent camp for Gentry. It wasn't terrible. Don't misunderstand me. But I was always searching for a number three. I wasn't searching for a number two. I think the fan base was. And, and even Kevin Colbert, when asked about it, was like, hey, Grimble's a number two right now. Let's see how he does replacing Jesse James. So my focus was always in on the number three spot and what happened with Gentry and not the number two spot with Grimble. All right, so we'll, we'll we'll keep waiting. But as it looks right now, I mean, we're already in Wednesday now. This team ain't making no moves. No, they're not. No one's going to IR. No no tight ends being added. I mean, the roster is set. The, the, the only thing that I think that maybe you – and it's so remote – is making a Saturday a Saturday shuffle for, for special teams, you know? Yeah, uh, I mean – But who, it, 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 it would have been So who would you even not be – yeah, I mean, I team. Holton, you know, it may be, yeah. I, you know, I, I, it is so remote, but I, I want, it has crossed my mind, you know. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't see the point. They, why not have it? The roster set now. Nothing's you know, going to change. You know, if you're going to have maybe a couple of guys that that uh, that that you think might be banged up, you know, uh, what what if both, what if Grimble and Oh, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some, some someone else uh, in, in here. Chick or Ola. Yeah, I mean, just something from a special teams aspect that you could parlay into maybe uh, also giving you a reason to put uh, 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 Deontay Johnson down too, you know, uh, from a special teams aspect. That That's the only way it's kind of crossed my mind. Do I think it's going to happen as we sit here right now? No. But uh, I just wanted to throw it out there that it has crossed my mind kind of a Saturday, you know, a Saturday shuffle, if you will. Yeah. The only interesting note would be if Davis doesn't play, then they only have three safeties. Do they do anything there? But there's really no one on the practice squad. I mean, Marcus Allen and then Mike Hilton can play free safety. So I don't think you're going to see a change there. But they would be obviously light at true safeties if if Davis can't go. All right. uh, What else do we have to talk about? I think that was everything for me. So if there's something else you you wanted to address, uh, go for it. Otherwise, we can jump into some reader emails. All right. I'm, uh, it seems like we're missing something, Alex. Uh, no, I think that was it from Tomlin's presser. Um, all the big stuff. Oh, and, the the, uh, the Ben thing, the the Ben interview. Uh, it, honestly, there's not even much for me to talk about. You just asked about set, AB. Set, and, set set it up. Set it up. Okay, so uh, Andrea Kramer of ESPN interviewed Ben Roethlisberger talking about basically the offseason and just kind of rehashing of the A-B situation, and Ben was deflecting and pretty noncommittal, which is smart at this point. I think you move on, um, but anything to note from, from that interview? Boy, she sure looked, I mean, for such a veteran reporter in, in Andrea Kramer, who I think she's done a lot of great stuff over the years and all, it sure seemed like she was waiting for a gotcha moment, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, with him, the old hung by the tongue, as I like to like, like mm-hmm. to like to say when it comes to that. So uh, I, I didn't really. It was uneventful, quite honestly. Yeah, at, le- at least, at least part one uh, uh, of it was. Now that what they're what they've done is they've thrown part one out here uh, and released it on the NFL, you know, on, on Total Access yesterday, and it circulated in the internet, and, and and did last week, and and heck, Matthew, I think even already has a post on Steelers Depot about it this morning, at, and they want to tease you for part two, but uh, I mean, there there was a point where I thought, you know, Andrea Kramer was going to get up and 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 slap Ben Roethlisberger and say, who who ordered the code red, you know? Uh, what? Uh, that that went over your head too, right? No, no idea. What you're th- have you, you ever seen a, f- a few good a few good men? Have you ever seen that movie with nah. Jack Nicholson and all? Nope. My God, I don't were... have one of those eight millimeter things you watch. No, though. that was before eight millimeter. <laughs> My God, what movies? What movies have you watched? What movies do you like that were pre two thousand? I don't watch a lot of movies, but uh, as you can as you probably picked up on uh, the Die Hard series. Uh, oh, so what a, a damn Christmas what, movie! What's that? It's a damn Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah, the best Christmas movie ever. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, that's basically my my scene. Is anything with uh, Bruce Willis or Woody Harrelson? Oh man, what am I gonna do with you, Dan? Uh, <laughs> Make you more know, references over my head. Yeah. How many how many people listening do you think really have watched or can get that reference? I don't 50%? know. I I don't know. It seems by by the day I get older. 
You know, with, yeah. with, with I, I'm, I'm losing touch with, with our fan base, man. Uh, how many <laughs> people out there got the code red reference that I just, just made? Let me, help me out, at least on Twitter or or uh, uh, email the terrible podcast at gmail.com. You know, and I threw out there last night, too, and I guess it went way over your head, too. I, I'm, I'm guessing you never watched the movie Fatal Attraction either, right? Nope, never have. And uh, you wouldn't have gotten my. Uh, it looked like Andrea was the one that boiled the bunny. Uh, yeah. Oh, I had no idea what you guys were talking about. I thought they were, <laughs> I thought they were just. I wonder how many. Yeah, I got to be careful now on the Twitter machine on the podcast how much stuff goes uh, right. go, go, goes out over people's heads now because I've reached that age where you throw it out there and not everybody gets it anymore. So, mm. uh, uh, but uh, look, uh, long and short of it, I. It just seemed like it was trying to be a gotcha kind of type moment there. And I, I thought Ben answered answered the questions perfectly, really. I mean, there's not a lot there to talk about. The fact that we're talking about that there's not a lot to talk about, <laughs> I, I, I think, speaks volumes, right? Yeah, us talking about a very boring conversation about how I don't watch movies was still more exciting than the Ben interview with Andrea Kramer. There was nothing from that. Well, there you go. And then we'll, uh, uh, just as a a quick update, AB is bitching about getting fined, uh, fined, (laughs) fined. That's not, I told you that's not going to go well. (laughs) It's not going to go well at all. What was the Instagram caption? Something about the team. Do you have that pulled up? Uh, I can pull it up for you real quick here. It's yeah. not. It's definitely not hard to find on on the internet right here. When your own team want to hate, but there's no stopping me now. Devil is a lie. Everyone got to pay pay this year, so we clear. What does that mean? Uh, well, to put that in context, that's in response from being fined fifty three, basically fifty four thousand dollars for missing practice. Uh, he was pre- previously fined forty grand for missed uh, training camp practice August eighteenth, and then fined again on August twenty second. He posted the screenshot of the letter he got from Mike Mayock. So kudos to Mayock for for doing that. But yeah, uh, that's gonna be fun in Oakland. Does does if 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 Mike Mayock could have foreseen the future from the time he made the trade until this moment right now? where we are in time that's the only that's the only jump ahead in the time machine uh that that do you know what uh, a delorean is and a, hey, a, a, a time machine and did you ever watch the movie back to the future mm-hmm. yeah i got okay. marty mcfly I got you. I, 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 it really it really feels like gruden made that move to trade for ab and never told mayock until it was done like i don't i don't know if that's how it went but that's how it feels like that was like a gruden driven move man I, I don't i see it i see it kind of more of a tandem uh, Alex, I yeah, I, I've kind of viewed it more, and I've kind of questioned be, because of feeling that way. I've kind of questioned why Mike Mayock, who who doesn't, you know, has a history on, on as being a draft analyst and not liking all the shenanigans and all the, you know, he mm-hmm. he just seemed more like a uh, let's just talk about the X's and O's football, and you know, I can do with all this other stuff, you know. Uh, Kind of surprising that he'd sign off on 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 on, on such a thing there. So I, you know, let me let me restate the question: If Mike Mayock, you know, could 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 go into this point in time right now and then go back and and have that information, would he would he allow this deal to happen? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I would love to to for Mayock to write a book someday, and hopefully he will because he's got a lot of stories to tell for his entire life. Um, you know the thing though, Alex, and I, I, I'm guessing you didn't watch any of Hard Knocks this year. No, uh, I don't have HBO. Uh, but and look, it, it it really it it really didn't live up to to the hype at all. I mean, mm-hmm. overall, it was it was a disappointing season for Hard Knocks for me personally. I don't know about the other listeners out there and all like that. I mean, the last two episodes were better, but it didn't make up for you know you know what I'm saying there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's like using a tube of toothpaste that you're not really a you know you use the toothpaste because you have to use the toothpaste, but you're not a big fan of it there. You know, Dave, I hope you're uh, brushing your teeth. I don't know what analogy <laughs> that is, but dental hygiene. Uh, uh, here's the thing: when, when, when they showed some clips on, of him being back on the practice field talking about AB, and I, I'm not breaking any news here. Man, that guy can run a damn route, man. Mm-hmm. That would be the thing I was going to say is that, yeah, there's a lot of BS this team's dealing with right now. But when AB catches seven balls for 100 yards on a score in week one, it's going to be pretty easy to put past all the crap this this franchise has had to deal with the first month of the season. It goes back to the whole thing is where where is the where is the trade off of what a guy can provide? 
provide you on the football field mm-hmm. uh, uh, were to base, you know, uh, compared against what he's going to cause you in yeah. turmoil and trouble off of it. Yeah. Is, is the juice worth the squeeze is the question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, oh, okay. that's a common reference. Oh, Still come on! I, like that. you, that's a common reference. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, all it's right. not. You, you tweeted me. <laughs> Tell me that's a that's a phrase. Yeah, it's a phrase. All right. All right. All right uh, <laughs> uh, what a. It's going to be fun to look. The the season of Raiders Hard Knocks is going to be better than the the training camps uh, uh, portion of Hard Knocks, right? Yeah, that's the way this thing's going. Okay, Alex, let's go to some questions. Defensive snap percentages. The hard grade. Boy, here we go. We're going to answer questions that we just talked about here. Uh, from Tim, he writes in, the hard grade extend signed or not had me wondering how many snaps he's in there for. What percentage of snaps did he play last year? And for context, what about Hayward and Tuit and top 10 to 15 defensive guys in general? Uh, well, look, we, we told you that it was, uh, what do we say, just under what, 45 point. Forty-three percent, uh, something like that. Oh, uh, with uh, with Hargrave, it was like four hundred and fifty. I think right at 450, 454 snaps for Hargrave total defensive snaps last year. Uh, and obviously with uh, with Hayward and and and, and to it, it was much much more. You know. Yeah, uh, eight eight hundred forty one for Hayward, six ninety three for to it. So Hayward was at eighty and a half percent to it at basically two thirds. Um, he missed a little bit of time, uh, I believe. Uh, and I think it's going to be, yeah, I, if, if Hayward and Tewitt stay healthy, they're going to be about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent. And then Hargrave probably sitting around 40, probably about 40 percent because he's going to be capped by Tewitt and Hayward playing as much as they are. Right. And look, you're going to get uh, a Lulu snap, so a few mm-hmm. snaps in there. Uh, McCullers, barring injury, might get two snaps a game. You know, three snaps a game at, at most. You're not going to see. You know, hopefully, we don't get in a situation where, where we have to see him come in there. But you would like to see Hargrave get some rotation time in there in sub packages because of the way he rushes the quarterback. Yeah, I think that they are. You know, we had the idea would they play some three three five the way they did very late last year, and that's probably not going to happen because you have all the the depth at inside linebacker. Um, the reason why you played three three five in part was because you didn't have a second inside linebacker, so that's one option to get Hargrave snaps. It's probably off the table. Um, so it's going to make that job even more difficult. Uh, definitely something we'll be tracking every week, right? Yep, but again, for this year, at least a good problem to have because the defensive line depth is great. You have some of the best front three in football, um, and if someone goes down, then you have a replacement. Yeah, I don't want to get into uh, uh, most underrated or whatever, but, I mean, uh, this defensive line right now isn't talked about enough, I don't think, heading into no, the season. I agree 100%. Uh, I don't know if criminally unrated is the proper term. But if it's not, it's damn close. Uh, Rick mm-hmm. Rick Mooney writes in on UDFA players. Alex and Dave, now that team's 53-man rosters have been finalized, can you do a study to see if the higher-paid, undrafted guys made the teams around the league? New England was one of those guys that spent a little bit more. I'm curious if it makes any difference. Thanks for your hard work. I, I guess we could... Uh, you know, so hard to, to, to find sometimes the exact signing bonuses on some of these undrafted guys. I mean, uh, I, I know over the cap does a great job in a lot of that, but I think even they miss some of these because they just, you know, unless you, unless you have access to that NFLPA database, you don't get all of them, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I think we know who some of the top guys were. I just went to New England because I, I remember the one tight end being paid like $100,000, and it looks like he was released outright, it appears. So it's a, it's a good question. Interesting study. That would be, I don't know if I have time to do it uh, with the season so close, but, but a good study to look at. Rick, uh, you know, kind of remind us like at this point, it's kind of not relative, so to speak. Uh, but it, you know, come, come during the off season. Why don't you send us, put it on your calendar, send us another email about this to remind us. And maybe it's something we can dive into there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see here what we got from John Calderelli's back uh, again. Hi, Dave and Alex. I have been a Steelers fan since the early 70s. I bet, I bet, I bet John got a couple of my references there uh, mm-hmm. with, with the Aliquippa roots. Uh, we have had two franchise quarterbacks since then uh, with many, many disappointments in between. I'm not saying that Devlin Hodges is a franchise quarterback, but he impressed me as a talent-worthy 
uh, 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 further development. I've seen much worse with this franchise over the years. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't mean to giggle. <laughs> I'm sorry. Be John. nice. Uh, Be John, nice to I'm John. sorry. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Alex. Uh, yeah. I was shocked and disappointed that this organization did not grant him a spot on the developmental squad. I thought he was among the best 64 on this team. From from a talent standpoint, I do not understand why this happened. Did he reject an offer? Where is he now? And is there a chance he could resurface with the Steelers? I'm very disheartened. There has been no discussion about this talented prospect. Thanks, John. I my I think my, I'm not I'm I'm not gonna. I'm not going to say anything more to my giggle. Uh, <laughs> okay. All due respect, John. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was disappointed. I'm not shocked by it, though. He was not going to make the 53. Obviously, carrying four quarterbacks is almost unheard of in the NFL, even on a practice squad spot. Uh, he, he, I know that it's looked like he may, he had like a deal with the XFL, but he said he didn't have a contract. You know, he just tweeted at them. He probably will end up in some sort of developmental league. Maybe go to the CFL or something like that. Don't ever expect him to see to see him in a Steelers uniform again. But I think he can have a career professionally somewhere, and maybe he can resurface in the NFL during tryout circuit, off season, futures contract, something like that. But you know, he had a good camp. He was in a tough spot. You just kind of move on from it. Um, you know, the sun will come out tomorrow. Look, he. He was a he one of the one of the best probably that you've seen in your yeah. in, 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 oh, yeah. you know when it comes to the Steers number three quarterbacks number three number, number three th- well what I mean number four you know he in other words he could be a number three yeah yeah okay I get what you're saying yeah yeah I mean the guy was was better than any number four quarterback that I've really seen in camp in, in my lifetime but that said I mean we still didn't see enough of him I mean be honest with me. We, we, you, you saw him during training camp. How many? How many snaps? How many real, real eleven on eleven snaps do you reckon he had? In, in, I can in get camp? you his pass attempts. I don't know. It's not all of his reps, obviously. Okay. Um, let me get you his, his pass attempts. It was it was not a lot because he was still number four. I mean, even with Ben missing a lot of days. Uh, let me get the overall numbers. Hodges had 85 pass attempts. To put that in perspective, Dobbs had 134, Ben 142, Rudolph 150. So he still didn't get a ton of work being the number four. And then I think, uh, what did he have, like eight, uh, 18 attempts headed into the finale? Is that right? Does I believe so. Right? I think it was like 10 of 18 coming into the finale, and what did he throw, 12 passes, 14 passes in the finale? Right. I mean, look, I... I just I, I find it kind of kind of amusing that people were trying to anoint him the best kind of you know deep quarterback talent since the 70s. You yeah, know? but I I think he's got the talent to resurface somewhere, and I hope that he does. Ah, I'd be surprised if he does. You know, anywhere? You don't think he can go play in the XFL? I mean, I'd like to see him play. I I think possibly in the I, what what I mean is in 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 the NFL. You know, I think yeah, uh, I think we've seen the end of that. Look, who would you have rather have, Landry Jones or Devlin Hodges? No, I would have taken Landry, obviously, with the NFL experience. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend that Hodges. I never had Dobbs off my my 53. Never had Hodges as a number three. I just thought there was enough talent to to warrant that long look. Like John said, I thought Hodges was one of the top 64, and I don't like cutting good players, especially good quarterbacks. That was my whole philosophy. Are you surprised he's not on a practice squad? You are aren't on, you? on the Steelers practice on squad? any practice squad. No, because. Teams only carry two to three quarterbacks. I mean, everyone has their guys, and so it's just hard to try to get a fit, and especially to go to another team, a team that hasn't seen him in camp the way that we've seen him in training camp. I mean, I I get it. It's just the nature of the position. It's just, you know, there aren't many quarterbacks in the NFL. It's just a hard, you know, group to crack. All right, Chuck Griffith writes in, if you're a betting man, you had had, had one unit to put down on the first practice squad player to be called up. Uh, to the 53 man squad, who you betting on? You well, everyone's first. gonna everyone's gonna say Johnny Holden. I'll say Trey Edmonds just to be a little different. But it'll uh, all be injury dependent. Yeah. Uh I, I would Johnny Holton would be my first guest, and then I would say uh uh Spillane. Spillane? Yeah, I got a, just, probably get ten linebackers. Huh? Just just, just got, from, from an injury standpoint, not from a uh But even have, if someone goes down, you still have, you know, nine other linebackers. Yeah, I just think he'd right. be the one. All right. I, well, Marcus Allen's probably a good one, too, because safety is so thin. I could see Allen getting called up week five or something. Uh, the man asked for my for my guess. I gave him my guess. All right. Uh, you like Robert Spillane. I like him, too. But he had a good camp. 
Uh, let's see. From Brett Nile. Hey, David Knox. Uh, now that the roster is set, discussion is starting to find clarity. Now that we have a bone, uh, I find that I have a bone to pick with Alex. Specifically, Alex has se- said s- several times in the last few weeks about how the Steelers have invested in the offensive line. Now, I'll give you that Pouncey and DeCastro De- De- De were an investment, but that was 2010 and 2012. Currently, three of their five starters are undrafted free agents, and six of their nine offensive linemen were not draftable by the team. Banner, Villanueva, and I believe Filer were all cut by at least one other team, and at least three of them, Villanueva, Filer, and Finney spent a full season or more on a practice squad, meaning any other team could have claimed them off waivers to the roster, uh, via roster or cut down. I'm not sure how that qualifies as investing. For example, they've spent five of their uh, last seven round, seven seven first round picks on linebacker position. That's definitely investing in the position. Now, if you're saying that you have done a great job developing linemen, or that you invested in the coaching and center, then uh, that that I can agree with. But to to us, I don't think anyone could see this approach as a recipe for a dominant line. Colbert certainly de- deserves credit for getting the right coaches and being effective with the evaluation. But you also have to admit there has been a sizable degree of luck as well. Don't get me wrong; I'd rather be lucky than good. But I don't think that 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 the way to build uh, the group is likely to be re- repeated anytime soon. Not even by the Steelers. Your thoughts? Thanks, guys. Love the podcast and looking forward to regular season. Let me jump in and answer that <laughs> first part for you, just to see if I'm 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 in 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 concert with you with, with maybe what you meant. Okay. In investing in offensive line, I mean putting their money back into their offensive line. Look at all these guys that have contracts on this mm-hmm. offensive line. Pouncey, DeCastro, uh, 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 Foster. Foster, Villanueva. I mean, four of your five guys uh, got paid. Now, if that's not an investment, I don't know what is. And the, the guy that just left in Gilbert, they paid him as well, too. I'm guessing that that's the that you were, and I don't remember word for word, maybe a, uh, Lord knows we're not going to do it, but if Brett wants to go back and find some some direct quotes, whereas you were insinuating uh, investment meaning draft, uh, anything other than draft, or, or uh, meaning draft, I, 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 I'll read them on the air for sure. But I, I don't take that as what you were meaning as investing in an offensive lineman. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not trying to kiss Alex's ass here. It's just you know because I, I I would pile on if if I had the chance. <laughs> but uh, I I'm assuming that's what what you meant. Dave, I'm gonna hire you to be my defense attorney because that's what I that's what I was getting at. It was not investment. Just I would. In- it would fly. It, it probably flies over your head. I would use the Chewbacca defense quite a bit. Oh, I would a uh, three foot tall Wookiee or, or yeah, eight, 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 foot tall Wookie. eight foot tall Wookiee. You actually yeah. understand what the Chewbacca defense is, though, yeah. right? We watch South Park. That's the one thing that, that bonds us. Dave, All right. Is, is All right. Love of, of, All right. Uh, trace stuff. Um, yeah, the investment is, is not just draft capital. It's it's the investment in hiring a coach like Mike, Mike Munchak, identifying the talent, identifying the value that he brings, and being able to retain him for as long as you possibly could. It's the investment of – locking up your your talent when you find them along the offense line whether that's Ramon Foster UDFA or a first round pick like Marquise Bouncy it is also investing in the undrafted free agents finding talent there and knowing the value of that it's finding someone like Matt Filer on the practice squad investing in your pro scouts to to be able to identify that kind of talent and then be able to retain and and keep those guys around it's even doing small things like you know paying BJ Finney uh, basically a roster salary when he was on the practice squad back in what was that 2015 when teams were trying to poach him away I mean that's a small thing but that's something that they could have easily lost BJ Finney other teams might have just said eh you know we're not going to pay you that much 25 grand a year um so it's, it's investment in a lot of facets it's not just the draft capital uh, aspect of it and that's what i mean when i talk about the heavy overall investment it's it's draft capital it's financial you know contract extensions resigning guys investing in the coaching staff investing in multiple offensive line coaches you know you had munchak and surrett now you have surrett and adrian clem it's understanding the value of having two coaches to maximize reps and and divide the group up so i mean when i talk about investment it's it's in a lot of ways not just what round they got drafted in and look you know a lot of people talk about the Steelers having eye having the, the a good eye or Colbert and, and and the scouts having a good eye for wide receiver talent you know like it or not they've had it with offensive line too I mean you go back to the Ligurskis and 
Uh, who? I mean, who? Who can we name you before Ligurski? I'm, I'm trying to rack. I'm just sitting here trying to rack. You, uh, what, what, as far what, as un, 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 undrafted? Un, undrafted linemen that have 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 uh, uh, been worth their weight. You know, look, they, they went out and you know, uh, non undrafted guys after the first few rounds really haven't worked out overly well. Mm. Well, you have the Tony Hills and you have the uh, uh, boy trading for Sean uh, Sean yeah. May. Oh, uh, Wes- Wesley Johnson. Lord was taken away he had some talent but didn't work out in pittsburgh right i mean let's not act like this was luck either right i mean a sizable degree of luck do you do agree with i mean let, let, let let's let's shoot back at brett here i mean is it fair to use a term sizable degree of luck i mean that's qualifying in a, in a lot of ways uh no i just i just think it's the it's identifying the talent it's investing in 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 the coaches to, to coach up that talent and then retaining players to to maximize that potential so i mean yeah it's going to be a degree of luck you get that you know random udfa or you just happen to see signs you know fred johnson happens to sign with pittsburgh or to sign with any team i mean in that sense there's a little bit of luck element to it but they've done a great job of knowing you know who fits the system and how to coach these guys up so i think it's as much you know, building up that talent as it is being lucky and finding that talent. Brett, Brett's coming to uh, Vegas uh, in September and uh, wants to wants to have lunch, and I think we're going to make that happen. I wonder if he's going to punch me in the face. <laughs> That's why he wants to have lunch. Yeah. Maybe a soprano kind of kind of lunch. Brett, you must quit because uh, it does not make sense. Uh, when when uh, when it comes to your accusations with uh, with Alex, I think there. you're uh, you're you're jumbling. References there, real real lawyer versus fake. No, uh, no, no. The, you know, he he says in the uh, Chewbacca defense, he says uh, that does not make sense. But he doesn't say you must have quit. Here, I thought you would give me a whole. Uh, well, right? I was trying to mix the two because That's it's obvious. It's obvious to play yeah. with uh, play on the, the uh, on, on the OJ and Johnny Cochran and yeah. all like that. There, don't try to put me in my place, young man. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a good one. The preseason question you didn't expect. So uh, uh, this is from Glenn Thomas from Newton Square, PA. Uh, talks about he driving home, listening to the podcast, and his daughter. I uh, was wondering, you know, where my former co-host David Todd uh, went. She and, and he explained to her that, that David Todd's no longer with the show, but there's a new guy named Alex. Uh, she said that Alex and the other Dave uh, 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 ever met, you know, and she was over the, the initial surprise that we had never met in person. And she wants to know if, they, if, if, if you and I have ever met. And the answer to that would be? You and I? No, we've never met. Right, right. No. So uh, Alex would probably can't in to... Ohio. We gotta we gotta do a trip to, to the you know, that, We we actually might have to do that. We might have to make that happen next off season somehow, some way. Really, we we we, we probably would. But uh, Glenn, uh, appreciate. Uh, look, you know, I I just we you know I find people that tolerate me. I guess uh, I uh, mm-hmm. and once I find people that to uh, that tolerate me, maybe it's not a good thing to have uh, to meet them in person <laughs> 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 to, to 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 let them know me even more. But look. You you know, all, look, all the all the contributors really with uh, Steelers Depot, and very few listeners. You know, and uh, I've met David O. and, and Dr. Mel and, and a few others. You know, that, that make it out to Vegas, but logistically, it's just so tough. You know, uh, mm. when 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 it when it comes to to things like that. All right, have we run long enough? Yeah, I think we are we're pretty long today. So good stuff, good show. We'll be back Friday to preview the Pats game. Uh, let's see. Okay, that that that's got. I do have one more, but it's it's not worth reading here. We'll we'll read it on the next show. Let's see. Uh, thanks to Ben Volin. Uh, make sure you get on Twitter and follow him at Ben Volin. V O L I N. Uh, reach out to him. Let him know that you heard him on a terrible podcast and thank him for his time. You can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. You can follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, uh, maybe get some uh, get some uh, get Alex some pop culture uh, lessons. <laughs> uh, maybe you can I need them. Ap- afford to get on Netflix and watch some of these movies that I keep rambling out about and I'm like do you have a Netflix uh, or do you have a blockbuster I, I, <laughs> yeah I have movie pass uh, movie gallery which is old, old one in my house no I just have I got Netflix for this month so recommend some stuff for me I've tried. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean the general viewership. Uh, yeah. Stuff. Uh, okay, uh, you can also get a year's uh, uh, subscription to Steeders Depot for an ad-free version of the site for twenty-five dollars by going to SteedersDepot.com and hitting the ad-free. 
uh, button up right now, navigational bar. Uh, get your questions in. Friday show, we're going to uh, get into the X's and O's and really preview this upcoming game against the Patriots. We'll have our week one picks against the spread as well, too. I'll uh, hold uh, make Alex uh, do the uncomfortable portion of that part mm. of the show every year as well, too. Uh, maybe we'll have some more things to talk about, the uh, injury report and everything that goes along with that. I've rambled enough today. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.